Welcome to The Hair Loss Show. Dr. Russell Knudsen and Dr. Vikram Jayaprakash discuss issues relating to hair loss and the medical and surgical treatment of hair loss in both men and women. Hi everyone and welcome to The Hair Loss Show, episode number 14. My name is Dr. Vikram Jayaprakash. I'm Dr. Russell Knudsen, welcome. Right. Well, on our last episode, we went through strip surgery, we talked about, and then we talked about the pros and cons with uh, FUT surgery. So today's episode, we're gonna flip it over and talk about FUE, because that's very popular and gaining in popularity. Uh, but it's important that everyone should know about what are the benefits and what are the disadvantages of, uh, of this procedure. If you go onto the internet, you would think there are only pros mm. and no cons. So I'm afraid it is our sad duty to tell you that everything has its pros and everything has its cons. So today we'll focus on the benefits and the risks associated with FUE. So FUE is a great procedure. And so just to, to recap uh, quickly, uh, basically what we're doing at, from the back of the head, we're taking little punches of follicular units or grafts that create a tiny little dot-like scar and we're scattering them over the entire back of the, the head. And then we extract those one at a time and we make the recipient sites and we uh, plant, uh, plant those there. So let's remember we're creating a hole because we're taking out a cylinder and very small cylinder of full thickness skin. And we're creating a hole on the back of the head. And the only way that hole can fill up is by a scarring process from the bottom of the skin through to the top of the skin. We call that healing by secondary intention. And as the scar comes, that column of scar comes up, it's a cylinder of scarring that's created there. It does tend to contract, but it is a, it is a scar nonetheless. And people need to understand uh, that, that it's not plucking hairs, mm -hmm. right? People come in with this idea that FUE is plucking hairs. We're not, we're cutting skin because hair is an organ of the skin. If we pluck the hair and plant the hair, it won't grow because it doesn't have enough stem cells Correct. to actually create a new hair. You need to take the stem cells out which reside in the skin. So I'm just emphasizing to you, we have to create these holes because we have to take these cylinders of skin that have the stem cells in them. And so this if, is, this is, if this is a, a cross section of the skin with a graft, what we're doing is we're cutting out a cylinder of tissue that incorporates both the hair and the, the bulb, the root, with the stem cells in it. And so we're going right down to the fat layer, so excising that. So it is ostensibly a surgical procedure that we're performing. Yes. And then once that's left, that, that's, that leaves you with a, uh, a cavity that over time will, will slowly heal. heal up. So that takes about seven to 10 days, right? So again, just emphasizing that all the surgeries that are done for hair transplantation create scarring, it's just different types of scarring. And this hair does not grow back. That's the other important Correct. thing. Correct. Because that's the other misconception. It's gone. If it's been taken properly, it doesn't regrow. All right, so let's talk about the pros of doing FUE. We talked about the cons of strip surgery, and one was the linear scar. Mm. So obviously a con of a strip becomes a pro of FUE because there's no, no. linear scar. Yes, there are dot scars. Right, but no linear scars. So patients feel that this A seems a bit like less invasive, less, less surgery, right? Less mm -hmm. surgical, if you like, uh, less invasive. And the other advantage that they uh, feel they have is they can wear shorter hairstyles. Correct. So number two for our pro is the ability, if the harvesting has been done properly, to wear your hair super short. So like a buzz cut, a number one or a number two. But I do emphasize if it's done properly, because if we over harvest an area, then it becomes see-through. If we take too much hair out and people come to us with different degrees of density, different quality of their hairs. And so if, even if you do beautiful you know, uh, technique of taking them out and not damaging the hairs, uh, if you take too much out of an area, that becomes noticeably thinner and see through compared to the surrounding uh, hair. So it requires not just the advantage of these, but it's also requires good technique. So those are the major advantages. So we were starting to touch on the con. So mm. the con here is that you're only taking 20% maybe of the hairs out of an area. So if you need a large number of grafts, you need a large harvest area. 
right? So if you are using a large harvest area, uh, then uh, you can, if you take too much out of an individual area, you get thinning see-through donor area. That's the first problem. The second problem is the safeness of the donor hairs. Because again, if you're trying to gradually thin a large area using FUE, which is really what you're trying to do, is gradually thin a large area, by definition, in people with crown balding, particularly our younger patients with crown balding, we are forced to go closer to the balding margin to take those hairs out. And as I said in a previous uh, uh, podcast, if you take out a hair that later on becomes a thinning or balding area, firstly, the dot scars become more visible. Secondly, you lose the grafts on the top of your head. It's a double whammy. So it's critically important that these hairs are chosen and we are making life difficult for ourselves in some patients if we're trying to harvest just using FUE mm. as our technique. And people forget that. So that you, know, you, you are creating scars now, I'm not going to call that a con because it would be a con for FUT as well. We both techniques create different scars. And, that, and that's an important thing because a lot of people go, it's scarless. But when they've had FUE and they expect they want to be able to shave their head at the back, of, you know, shave the back of their head. And they go, hang on, I can see the little tiny little dots that are spread over a large area. You go, well, yes, that, that is the scar. It's minimally scarring. Uh, that you've got to be and here is and here's another of. catch 22 that people don't think about that is if you're trying to gradually evenly thin out an area where you ha if you're using a large number of grafts where you haven't harvested still has the most density and that could look like an area zone that just looks thick compared to everything else so you're forced to go into that zone to thin it a little bit so it doesn't look noticeably thicker than the surrounding hairs and guess where that zone is right below the balding margin. Which is at risk. So now you are having to go and harvest. Now I've talked to a few surgeons about this and they agree that they have to harvest in these riskier areas because otherwise they get this zone of full density with significant thinning below it and balding above it. And it just doesn't look right. It looks like there's a patch there um, of, of thick hair and they are forced to go into an area that they know is potentially a future problem. So I'm gonna put that down because, and I'm gonna call it a zoned look. And this is different than thinning of the donor area because thinning of the donor area comes from over harvesting in that area. But then what, you, what, we've, what we've got that is different here is that we're trying to, we're trying to do right by avoiding that margin between, that is next to the balding area. But in doing so, you run the risk of there being this differential, you know, differentiated area of where you've harvested from and the thicker area, which is closer to the, uh, to the balding area. And that's the, like you said, the catch 22. So the zoned there. look. Yeah. All right. So what does that mean? Well, that means that if you're practicing a little bit of caution in your decision making and you know that you need a large number of graphs, you need to think very carefully about this. The younger you are and you're thinking about a large number of graphs, the more carefully you need to think about this. Unfortunately, there's a trend around the world for people to do cosmetic medical tourism where they go to places that are famous for their FUE surgeries because they do huge numbers of graphs in one session. So we often see these advertisements and these patients who've gone somewhere to get 5,000, to get 6,000, to get 4,000 FUE graphs done in a single session. Now this sounds like a tremendous boon to the patient because this bald patient can have this massive amount of hair planted in their head in one day. But the real problem for these patients, and because they're often in their 20s, these guys, 20s and 30s, is that if you've taken four or 5,000 of these FUE grafts out from this area, it's a very large area, it's a large harvest, there's a, probably a lot of density being yeah. taken out of the areas, there's not much left for future needs using that technique. So if you lose more hair and the balding margin comes away from the grafts and leaves you this rim of baldness that we see all the time happening to our patients as the baldness appears, there's really not much left in the donor area to deal with it. So again, I know that we're preaching a conservative viewpoint here, but the reason we're, we're preaching that is because future balding is unpredictable. So I think what you're talking about is a consequence of bad planning. Correct. Um, and so I, I'd probably flip it around and go, actually, that's, you know, and that's probably where 
FUE in my mind has a slight limitation in that if I've got someone who's got a you know a large amount of balding, I'm more inclined to go maybe you're and they're young. I'm more inclined to go maybe you're better off with strip surgery. So I think FUE is you know you're in a lot more of a comfort zone if you don't have a large harvest that you need to do because you know you've you're not over harvesting from the back. You're not getting too close to any riskier areas that may uh, bald in, in, in the future. And, and if, you, if you're in, within those parameters, you know you're in a, you know, in a nice, you know, clean comfort zone. So I think that's probably what, another thing what I'd put there is, and I know a lot of surgeons go, no, we can harvest large numbers. But when you do that, you run the risk of you know, getting into tiger country. I sort of limit um, to a certain extent, you know, we still do a few thousand in, in, with with, uh, um, with FUE, but I don't go as aggressively as I probably would with strip. Okay, and so let's go back to the third pro. I know we're coming a better order well, of we've this. We've got one, do we? And that is the we, no, no, but it follows on from that point, and that is that if we did strip surgery first, when the scalp has its most flexibility, we're taking the uh, the hair from that area and we're using it. And then as the patient gets older, the balding gets larger, the scalp flexibility has uh, has become reduced. It's become harder to take um, more uh, strip scars because A, it's tight. B, you don't want that linear scar too close to a future balding area. You can cherry pick your hairs using FUE. So mm -hmm. this is ex expands the donor area, right? For people, in if they're prepared to use strip as well as using FUE, FUE can expand the donor area in these patients. So it's not expanding donor, donor area, area in everybody, but it expands the donor area in strip in patients with previous strip surgery. And I'm quite happy to tell everybody um, that, that these patients that have had previous strip surgeries can come back and have FUE carefully done so as not to expose the linear scar. Because if you take out too much hair above or uh, the, uh, the donor scar from a previous strip surgery, you're going to expose the scar. So again, it's got to be done in a sensible way, but it expands the donor area in strip patients. And so our patients are living longer and longer. I would argue that that means they're getting balder and balder. So again, we need to think about the future. We, we, talk, we bang on about this planning 10, 15, 20 years down. The modern era of instant gratification is completely against the way we want to treat baldness because if baldness was not a progressive condition, this would become irrelevant, right? But baldness is and we can't not, predict it. It's not as stable, it's unpredictable, and you should consider that everybody that comes to, you to, to see us is going to have less hair in five years' time, 10 years' time, 20 years' time. So we have to do our thinking with them to plan for that potentiality. We've got one more to talk about on the con side, right. right? And that is, we have to shave the donor area. Now, there are, if you're using um, a robotic technique for the harvesting, uh, there is a robot that does this. It relies on video. If it relies on video, it can only do it if there's short hairs, right? So they have to be shaved down to one millimeter in length for the robot to work. It's a lot easier for FUE surgeons to do it if they do shaved FUE. Non-shaved FUE, where you either just trim out just the hairs you want to take, is very slow and very time consuming, or trying to do long hair FUE, even though it's technically possible, is very time consuming, very difficult skill to master. And you can't do large harvests. And you can't do large harvests. So techniques. the reality is we shave the donor area. So for people that need to get back to work and uh, don't want to see uh, the bandage on the back of the head because there's holes there. Remember what we talked about? A thousand FUE grafts means a thousand holes in the back of your head that we would put an antibiotic ointment on and, uh, and put a bandage bandage on for the first night, but then you've got every one of those a thousand holes develops a thousand scabs and those thousand scabs become a thousand scars so, over time. But it's not instantly uh, invisible. It takes a couple of weeks 
for, the, for the hair to grow back and for the scabs to settle and for it then to settle down. And you can have little pink marks. So you're really making it difficult for yourself to have it as an invisible surgery for those around you. In that initial you, phase. In the initial phase if you're doing so it. So that head. is one aspect of things. The other thing that we shouldn't forget is women. I mean, I've yet to meet uh, a female that's required hair transplant surgery that thought it would be a really good idea for me to shave the back of their head. So I haven't... I, okay, uh, so if you, have, if you have a small... If you've got a small case? If you've got a small donor case? area. No, no, I'm talking about a small donor area. All oh, right, okay. And, and our women often only have decent hair at the bottom, sure. at the back. So if you only have a small area, but you have a lot of thinning on top, taking 100% of the hairs out of the area you harvest from that smaller area is going to give you more to play with on the top of the scalp than trying to do FUE where you're only trying to take 20 or 25% of the hair out of the area. So for people with restricted donor areas, it's a disadvantage to use FUE. Because yeah, you if you've only got a restricted out. donor area, you can't get a lot of grafts. Great. So just to reiterate, Dr. Vicker and I are both big fans of both procedures. We think they're both excellent procedures and sometimes it does matter what you choose and sometimes it doesn't matter what you choose. But what we've tried to do is to talk you through our thought process so you understand how we would approach different patients coming to us. We would think of different ways that was the most appropriate approach both initially and later on for that patient based on what a number of factors which we've discussed, age, degree of balding, you know, unpredictable future hair loss, uh, how big the balding area is, how quickly they want to get back to work without anybody noticing. There's a whole bunch of factors that go into the decision making. And so we, we find that we're very happy to offer both of those, but we want to give the patient good information before they make that decision. It's really important to make an informed decision and hopefully having this knowledge there, having this information can help you in that process. So when you do meet someone to discuss this, you are well armed with that so you can have a, uh, an informed discussion with them. Thank you for listening to us today and we look forward to seeing you next time. See you next time. Thank you very much.